at Antioch University. As one of the Little Rock Nine, Dr. Roberts has been demanded by several groups who wish to learn about the impact of the chaos in Little Rock on the social, cultural, political, and economic life of citizens in contemporary is a member of the adjunct faculty. He regularly consults with law enforcement agencies at the local, state, and national level. And what many of you may not know is Dr. Roberts also has consulted um, with our own Tournament of Roses, where uh, I think it's a classic move that when uh, asked why did African Americans have an issue with uh, the Tournament of Roses during the time when we were trying to diversify the executive committee, uh, Dr. Roberts simply said, um, black people have a concern about an all male, all white group, all in white suits. You shouldn't ask why do they have any concern uh, about the group that they're working with. So I think that that's key. Dr. Roberts is a wonderful family man and a friend. He spends a tremendous amount of time with his wife, uh, Dr. Rita Roberts. He also loves to be at home where he can enjoy a light supper with family. And I will tell you after a year of being confined in this pandemic, there are a lot of things and social aspects of hanging out with Dr. Roberts and his family that I miss. That I never would have thought I would miss like uh, Christmas caroling uh, at a family event or just getting together and having a very good time at Dr. Roberts house. So uh, we miss you. It's so good to see you even in via Zoom. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce to you all uh, a member of the Little Rock Nine, a friend, uh, a true blessing to not only the African American community, but to all who fight in, uh, for against oppression and injustice, a pillar of our community, Dr. Terrence Roberts, so. Oh, thank you, thank you very much, Danny. And thank all of the rest of you for being here. Tonight, I'm going to share some thoughts about what I've come to call Lessons from Little Rock, after which we're gonna to talk together. And that last part is the most important part because as I sit here talking, I can only share with you what I already know. Hopefully by the end of our dialogue, I will have learned from you what you know. Now, that's very important. None of us know very much, none of us. I have a great deal of respect for my own storehouse of ignorance. On a daily basis, as I awaken, I realize my first task is to learn and to continue to learn. And if we're not doing that, then we're not fully participating in life as I know it. So to start, I'm going to ask you to go back with me to Little Rock when I first arrived. And that would be the year 1941. Now already that gives you context because the year is 1941, we're in Little Rock, Arkansas. And you can just about imagine that I am not a welcome addition to that society. Although, as it turned out, my birth was actually announced in the local paper, as was the birth of a lot of babies who were born during that first week. What's significant about it is, and prompted my mom to save that for me and to give a copy to me on my 12th birthday, was the fact that my parents were addressed not using the social honorifics of Mr. and Mrs., but simply as first names only. So the list starts off, Mr. and Mrs. Spotswood Billingsley, and it gives the daughter, Juliet, and her vital statistics. And that list continues, but then about halfway down the page, halfway down that list of births, those obligatory titles of Mr. and Mrs. suddenly disappear. The rest of the parents are introduced by first names only. So when you get to my entry, you will find recorded there, William and Margaret Roberts, son Terence. Now, the casual reader of that announcement might well have concluded that there's been some sort of a printer's mistake. This will be corrected in tomorrow's edition. The more astute reader, having knowledge about who we were at that time would have no problem interpreting all of the babies presented as a progeny of parents who didn't merit those titles were black babies. And that would have been most correct. Now, <clears throat> I'm sure that 
My mom hadn't expected that this would be any different, but she saved that not because she was proud of it, but because she wanted to share that with me as a way of continuing my education about where we were. You see, when I was born, this entire country was still operating under the aegis of a Supreme Court decision that had been rendered in 1896, Plessy v. Ferguson. The Plessy decision bequeathed to us terminology, separate but equal, pertaining to how we, the American public, would relate to each other in terms of sharing or not sharing resources that were available. The separate but equal doctrine applied to every aspect of human life. At the top of the triangle, if you will, at the apex of the triangle stood a group of people, so-called white people, at the bottom, so-called black people. Black people had no rights. This was constitutional in the eyes of the Supreme Court. Now, one caveat, Plessy was not the start of this madness. No, the Plessy court did not invent racial discrimination and call it constitutional. The Plessy court simply underscored and reminded us of this is who we have been for centuries. We could always go back to a starting point and we could choose arbitrarily. And I would suggest we start with 1619, the year 1619. I won't go into more detail about that, but that's a credible starting point for those of you who have a true interest in knowing who we were, who we have been, who we are. And so as a young person, I had to learn the rules of segregation. You know, my first thought, once I was able to articulate what I was really thinking and feeling was that I was born into a place that obviously was some sort of an aberration, that people in Little Rock were unusual, that here were a lot of crazy people who didn't seem to have their heads screwed on right. And I thought outside Little Rock, we'd find a group of sane people, people who were objective, able to discourse across lines of race and culture with ease. And yet, as I became ambulatory enough to move around the country, I had to conclude, nope, Little Rock's not unusual at all. Little Rock is prototypical. This whole country was in the throes of madness. My estimate was that what was going on, given the name organized, legalized segregation, was not only illegal, it was also immoral, objectionable, nonsensical, any way you slice it, it didn't make sense. You see, I came into the universe with some sort of DNA component that suggested I needed objective understanding of everything that I laid my eyes on. This made no sense. Couldn't make heads or tails of it. And no one was able to help me. In fact, when I tried to start conversations, particularly with black adults, I would often get a look of consternation or fear etched on their face. And often the verbalized response would be, boy, don't bring that stuff up. You wanna get us all killed? And then I knew I was in deep trouble. I couldn't even have a decent conversation about this madness. My alternative, find out for myself what was going on. It turned out to be fairly easy. It's all written down. The history of who we are has been cataloged. Now, some of you may have thought that you know American history, my hunch is many of you don't truly know American history. You know what you've been told and you have bought into what I call a supreme lie about who we have been as a people. The national narrative, the approved national narrative is not based on historical fact, folks. Nope, it's made up stuff. And that's one of the things we're gonna talk about later tonight as one of the lessons from Little Rock. But in any case, finally I was sent to school so I started school in first grade. And remember, this is an all segregated institution, all black institutions. So Gibbs Elementary, Dunbar Middle School, and Horace Mann High, where I spent one year of high school, were all segregated institutions. First grade though was wonderful. My first grade teacher, Miss Waugh by name, as we all sat down before her, all of our, all of our six-year-old classmates, myself and them, heard her say this, you kids must take on executive responsibility for learning. You have to become executives in charge of your own 
independent learning enterprises. And I don't know about the other kids, but for me, that sparked an inferno. I could feel this blazing fire. So I opted to start my own private learning academy right there in September of 1947. It made sense. Here was a woman who spoke sense. She understood what was going on. She, like all the other black teachers in those segregated schools, were operating with a smoldering anger because they were not allowed to pursue careers in their chosen occupations, things they'd studied for, but they could teach in the all black schools. It gave us an advantage as kids, however, because we had the best and the brightest because of segregation and because of this pool of teachers who were highly qualified, school became an oasis for me. One filled with magical things. Every day I learned things and I took executive control of my learning in first grade, remember? So by fourth grade, I was an expert. In fact, it was in fourth grade that somebody fourth grade teacher to name one, tried to ram down my throat something called manifest destiny. Well, I knew it was a lie, but I'd also learned by fourth grade that good students survive by not challenging teachers who might be vindictive if confronted. And so I've come to understand that, and if there are kids tonight listening, when you're in school, you have two tracks, one, learn how to do school, that is how to navigate this bureaucratic maze, that's one. But the second one and the more important one is the track you learn on. See, going to school doesn't necessarily have anything to do with learning, but it is a good resource. But you have to get through it if you're going to have the credentials you need to succeed in our society the way we're constructed. And so learn how to do the bureaucratic stuff so you don't get crunched by those gears, but also, be nimble enough to also maintain your executive responsibility around learning and do that one. And so this goes on. When I was 13 years old, I had somewhat of an epiphany about this whole business of racial segregation. Like I said, separate but equal applied to every single aspect of human life at that time. And I recall that summer when I was 13 was the year 1954. I wandered into a hamburger joint called the Crystal Burger. Now, I knew the Crystal Burger was owned by white people and they didn't have much love in their hearts for black people, but because they were a capitalistic enterprise and they needed customers, they did allow black people to buy food. And they also allowed black people to enter by the front door, which was quite unusual. Most places like that only had a side window or a back door for black clientele. Crystal Burger because it allowed you to walk through the front door, but they had a rule. Even though you could walk in by the front door, you could not under any circumstance sit down. You could not sit on the stools around the counter. You could not occupy a seat at a table. You had to stand and wait for your order, after which you took your order outside and ate it wherever you wished. I knew the drill. I understood the protocol. Because had I not followed the rules of segregation, my life may not have survived all of that Little Rock experience. So I was very careful. But on that particular day, 13 years of age, I thought to myself as I looked around, I made my order, but I saw all of these empty stools, all of these empty chairs. And even though I didn't think about it consciously, it just made, made sense for me to sit down. I was a paying customer. I must have thought that, I can't remember how, what I thought, but I sat down, but my sitting down triggered an instant response. Everybody else in there was white. The workers, the patrons, the few of them that were there, they didn't say anything. Not a vocal word was spoken, but as they turned to face me, the looks on their faces communicated non-verbally such a palpable message, I could feel it. And at that moment, I could feel something snap inside of me. And at that point, I canceled my order and ran out of that place and found myself crying profuse tears on the sidewalk. Then I began to run. I ran all the way home, crying as I went, feeling sad and angry, confused, just upset generally. At that point, 
as I was running home, the thought hit me, Terry Roberts, you can no longer obey these rules of segregation. It makes no sense. It's too demeaning. It's too debilitating to you mentally, psychologically, emotionally, physically, all of those things. It just didn't make sense. I knew I was in trouble at that point though, because if I didn't obey the rules, I could be taken out. In fact, just one year later, 1955, some of you recall, Emmett Till was killed in a town in Mississippi, in Money, Mississippi. Emmett Till and I were the exact same age. We were 14 years old in 1955. When I heard the news of Emmett Kill's murder in Money, Mississippi, I felt a tremendous fear. One, because I had vowed not to obey rules of segregation. And evidently Emmett Till had broken some rule of segregation. And for that, he was viciously tortured and killed there in Mississippi. Mississippi as a state is geographically contiguous to Arkansas. My thought was what would stop somebody who had killed Emmett Till from crossing the border and taking me out as well? Well, it's hard to imagine the impact that would have on somebody who's 14 years old, but I can recall it today as vividly as I did then. It was not only frightening, but it left me in a state of unease for a long time. Something else happened in 1954, however, that sort of mitigates some of that. The US Supreme Court in that same year ruled in the Brown case, Brown versus Board of Education, Topeka, Kansas, that it was no longer constitutional to discriminate. Now, interesting language, no longer constitutional. Now, obviously it was thought and felt and believed that it was constitutional prior to that. And I, I make this point for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that there are some among us who feel that the constitution, because it was written by people who were smart enough to figure out that this thing would never have to change, that the constitution could not lie. There would be no need to change it. Well, uh, that also is false because the Constitution has been amended many, many times. And there will be other times coming if we get our act together. Because one of the things we have to do at some point soon is to get rid of this electoral college madness, which by the way, as you study history, if you haven't already figured it out, that's simply an artifact from slavery. Slaveholders needed to have that assurance that they would have enough representation so that they could sway elections. But in any case, I was excited in 1954 because even though I didn't know what this would mean, this new court decision had some promise. No longer constitutional. I like the sound of that. I didn't absolutely know what I was gonna do because I'm still in that state of not knowing what's gonna to happen to me on a daily basis because I don't know if I can keep my vow of not to play by the rules or to challenge the rules. I was saved though, a few years later, 1957, the Little Rock School Board decided to try an experiment to desegregate one high school in Little Rock. They chose Central High, which happened to be my neighborhood school, by the way. I lived within walking distance. I was exactly six blocks from the school. I walked past that school all the time on a daily basis during school because I had to take a bus from my house and I caught the bus near the high school downtown and transfer to a bus going on the other side of town where there was a high school for black kids, Horace Mann High. But now the school board says, we're gonna do this in September 57, but we need volunteers. So they sent representatives to the two schools where there were black kids, one middle school, one high school, and that was for all the kids in Little Rock, all the black kids in Little Rock, one high school, one middle school. So they did, they sent representatives, posed the question, how many of you would join us in this experiment? 150 kids total raised their hands, me included. We go home that same day, 
report to our parents that we volunteered for this experiment in desegregation, at which point you could almost hear the noise of parental vetoes being exercised all over Little Rock. 140 of those parents said no outright, no way. My kid's not gonna wind up with his or her blood being spilled in the gutters of Little Rock, I won't have it. 10 sets of parents said yes, mine included. I told my parents that I had volunteered. They responded, okay, we will support your decision 100%. And then after a short pause, they followed up by saying, if you get up there and it's too hot and you wanna quit, we will support your decision to quit 100%. Now at that point, even though I didn't understand the dynamic at the point, I had the best of all worlds. I could stay or leave without fear of losing one iota of parental esteem. That was important. And I think during that year, as it turned out, I was able to use that because I knew if I wanted to leave, I could. I didn't have to stay. And it wouldn't matter to my parents if I stayed or not. But in any case, uh, there were 10 of us. So for a very brief moment, we were the Little Rock 10. That didn't last for very long because the father of the 10th child received a telephone call from his white employer saying to him, if you continue in this madness, don't bother coming back to work. Well, out of fear of losing his economic, uh, you know, survival mechanism, he pulled his kid out. Tragically, he lost his job anyway. That's something I could have told him even as a 15 year old. I knew from my own study about the mindset of people who embrace, wholly embrace racist ideology. They will tolerate no breach of protocol. And so we were nine. And I might point out here that our group of nine included six females and three males. That's an important number because the life of the black male was much more at risk than that of the black female. Her life was no bed of roses by any means. And yet uh, parents with sons very deliberately said no, no way. Well, with things like the image of Emmett Till in all of our minds, who can blame them, right? But there we were. We show up on the first day and the governor has called out the National Guard to keep us out. He had said on a televised talk the night before that the guard was there to keep the peace. He lied. They were there to keep us out. Well, we made attempts. We couldn't get in. We were out of school for about three weeks. And then at some point, because of the wrangling between the president and the governor, the Arkansas National Guard was removed and the Little Rock police was set up as our protectors and we were expected to go to school under the protection of the Little Rock police force. Now, any of you who know anything at all about the relationship between Southern white policemen and black people will wonder about our sanity. Why did you even think this would work? We got into the school, but we weren't there very long, maybe an hour or two, when the mob became so enraged they broke through the police lines, which wasn't that hard because the police line was very, very uh, flexible, if you will. In fact, some of the policemen joined the mob, ripped off their badges, but didn't turn in their guns and join the mob. And because things were so volatile, there was some discussion among the people on the scene that perhaps we should allow the mob to hang one kid and we'll save eight. The assistant police chief, a man by the name of Gene Smith, however, prevailed and he said, nope, we're saving all nine. He could do that because there was an underground parking garage in that school, which made it possible for all nine of us to be rounded up from class. We were rushed down to the underground garage, placed in a couple of squad cars, and the drivers were given the instructions, get these kids out of here safely, use the accelerator, only don't think of using the brake. And so we roared out of there and we didn't kill anybody, but we got home safely. Well, at that point, we knew there was no way we could go into that school if we didn't have protection. It was at that point that the president finally acted. 
and sent in the 101st Airborne Division. And I was elated when I saw that. Here were armed men, men with weapons of all kinds, with looks of you know combat readiness. And I thought, okay, I'm ready. I was telling this story once to a group of middle schoolers and I had told them just prior to that, that I was a, a nonviolent person, that the nine of us had actually taken a vow of nonviolence. And he interrupted me, he raised his hand. And he says, Dr. Roberts, you, you, you talk about your elation at having all of these men with guns. And yet you also told us that you were nonviolent. Isn't there a problem? I said, no, no, no. Uh, sometimes when you're nonviolent, you need friends with guns. Um, although he, he questioned the morality of that, and I did too, frankly, being honest with him. I said, you know, I have to rethink that. And I have since rethought it. And I've come to the conclusion that I am at this moment 99.9% .9 nonviolent. Now, I say that because I live in America. And America, if they speak any language at all here, it's the language of violence. In order for me to be an active participant in the dialogue, I have to reserve a little bit of my violent nature. <laughs> well, that may be stretching it a bit. But in any case, uh, we got into school with the help of the army. It was not the end of anything. This was actually the start of a real war that went on that whole year. Why? Because we were told in no uncertain terms that if you persist on being here, we will kill you. Either you leave voluntarily or we will kill you. And so attempts were made. How the nine of us survived with our lives, I can't tell you with any certainty how that happened. I have to think it was divine providence because there were times when we were not certain on any given day that our name wouldn't wind up on a coroner's list. I mean, there were some days when I knew I was going to die. One particular time was in gym class. I was the only kid in this class of about 50 or 60 boys. And a lot of stuff was going on. And the coach one day called us all together. And he said, fellows, I'm, I'm sick and tired of this stuff. You sneak up behind Roberts and you do these things to him. You, you are a bunch of cowards. If you were not cowards, if you were truly men, you wouldn't sneak up on him. You would simply challenge him face to face. You challenge him to the mat. And he pointed to the wrestling mat. And I thought to myself, coach, <laughs> this is not something we've had a discussion about. And I don't know if I agree to this, but by that time they had lined up. Every single one of those boys had lined up. Now I must admit, I think some of them were in line, not because they wanted to rip my head off, but because they wanted to preserve their place in the social hierarchy. They didn't want to be rebuffed by their fellows. But those at the head of the line, oh yeah, there was no question. They were going to kill me. In fact, the very first person was a kid named Jerry Tully. I'll never forget Jerry because we were assigned classes based on our homerooms uh, and the homerooms were assigned alphabetically. So I was in what's called the RST group. So Roberts and Tully, we had all of our classes together. And this kid made it his business to be wherever I was trying to kill me. Uh, so he was naturally the first one. Well, I said to myself, when I saw Jerry at the head of the line, I said, okay, Jerry. And at that point, strangely enough, a sense of calm pervaded my whole being. I was very calm as I looked at Jerry and I said to him, to myself, you want to kill me. And also you want to be wherever I am because that's the way it's been this whole year. I'm just about to die. Whether you or some of these other kids, I'm going to wind up dead here. But since you want to follow me, you'll have to die too. And since you're number one in line, it works out. So he came at me on the map. I sidestepped him and got him in a headlock. We were both about the same size, a couple of skinny little kids. And I discovered as we wrestled around on that mat that he had worn a military-like dog tag with a chain around his neck and a couple of dog tags attached to it. Well, I quickly seized that chain as an instrument to restrict his air supply and Tully was choking to death. Now remember, I've already concluded that I'm going to die and Tully has to die first. I'm all in. 
And the coach finally realizes what's going on when he sees Jerry Tully, he's struggling to breathe, he's turning purple, and he rushes over and says, okay, okay, that's enough, break it up, break it up. But you see, that was not an unusual happenstance that year, it was all crazy, absolutely crazy. Well, uh, we made it through the end of the year without being killed. One of our group graduated, one of our group got kicked out for fighting, so that meant Seven of us are now left. So with uh, one graduating, one kicked out, we have seven eligible to return. We let the governor know indirectly that we will be back. We're coming back in September for round two. And he was not happy about that. Finally, he decided he had a ploy, he had a plan. He decided, okay, to keep these black kids out, I will close down every public high school in Little Rock. Just close them all down. That'll keep the black kids out. Obviously, the governor wasn't that bright because when you close down the schools to keep the black kids out, obviously you keep all kids out, black or white. But uh, that was the caliber of governor we had. That's the caliber of governor a lot of people have in this country because uh, some of you probably know this better than I do. But to hold public office, you do not have to have evidence that you have a measurable IQ. They're not required. In any case, uh, because the schools are now closed and because being the executive in charge of my own learning, I don't want to languish in Little Rock wondering what's going to happen next. I accept an invitation from relatives who lived in Los Angeles. And I became an Angelino in August of 1958. Moved out here and enrolled in LA High convinced my entire family to follow me. So by December of 58, we'd all made the move and we've been Californians since. So I'll stop that part of the story there, but now what are the lessons? Well, I think the first lesson we learn is that the national narrative that many people have bought into that suggests that we are a people who believe in liberty, equality and justice is false. We really don't. We really don't believe in that. And that's a lesson we have to learn because if we persist in accepting the national narrative, it just leads to mental confusion. The only way that we can resolve the issues we face in this country is to be objective about who we are. And I have not in my entire life on this planet seen anybody actively confronting the historical record, saying we really must write this thing. We have to tell the right story. We've been lying to kids for years. We have to tell them the truth. You can only resolve the issue if you're truthful about it. And the truth is, we're not who we say we are. That's one of the first lessons. If we don't get that lesson, it's unlikely that we'll understand any of the other lessons. And so I try in my own way to spur people to do their own research. Open the books, it's all written down. You can find it the same way I did as a young kid. Nobody's hiding it. The interpretations, however, are problematic. As I listen to people sometimes talk about what they see as the valid origin story, some of them actually have internalized the nonsense from the doctrine of manifest destiny. And by the way, in short, what that means is manifest destiny is, is that God somehow ordained Europeans to occupy this entire land from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And if there were anybody here, get rid of them because they didn't belong here and it's your land. It's sort of like what God said to the Israelites, you can go and take Canaan and maybe that's where they got it from, I don't know. But anyway, it's, it's all kind of bonkers. Now that's the first lesson. Second lesson is this, once people have internalized that national narrative to the degree that they believe in it, they will do everything within their power to make sure that nobody else takes that away from them. And so based on the opposition we faced in Little Rock, that lesson rears up as being very valid. I was shocked at the intensity of the opposition in Little Rock. Oh, I wasn't naive enough to think there would be no opposition but I thought it would be manifested by people coming, giving voice to their upset, 
and then maybe going back to work or home wherever they were. But no, 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 these people camped out day after day outside the school, the mob was there yelling and screaming. And whenever any one of our faces showed up at a window or a door, the volume increased. That told me, and I learned the lesson then, people who believe in the ideology of racism will not give that up. They will not give it up. And so, so we have to learn that this is the truth. Some of us have not been convinced yet. Even though some of us saw what happened on January 6th at the US Capitol, we're not convinced. And it may take something else. I don't know what else you need. Uh, I've been hearing a lot lately about how some people are really upset because George Floyd was killed in such a pernicious way. Soda. And I thought, oh, okay, really? Are you that upset? You didn't know this was going on well before George Floyd? on a daily basis? Uh, well, you see, I suppose then that brings to mind another lesson. We who have chosen to be willfully ignorant must decide to erase the ignorance, to allow truth to enter and take root in whatever you have as a facility for holding truth in your life. Uh, I, don't, I don't see any other way. I don't see any other way. It's, it's not a dilemma to me. I realize that what we're facing is very pernicious in terms of attitudes and, and actions. But once we decide that that's not what we want, change it. And that's another lesson, uh, not necessarily from Little Rock, but it, uh, it fits. And that is adults as human beings do what they want to do. As Americans, collectively, we have not yet decided that we want to have a society that is equal for all people. We have not decided that. Now, we give lip service to it a lot. Oh, yeah, I hear people talking about it all the time. But nothing's being done. Absolutely nothing being done. Now, we have evidence that if there's something we really want, we do it. Some of you may recall, or some of you have read about something called prohibition in this country. Years ago, there were a group of people in power and control who decided that it would be prudent for us not to manufacture, sell, or imbibe alcoholic beverages. An amendment to the Constitution made it law. But how long did that last? Not very long. No, no. Prohibition was repealed. That, to me, is significant evidence in terms of doing what we want to do. Here we had a legal procedure to change the constitution to prohibit the manufacturing, the sale, and the imbibing of alcoholic beverages. But American citizens joined forces and yelled with a loud voice, no, no, no. We will retain our right to get drunk. You will not take that away from us. Prohibition was repealed. We have not even considered doing the same thing about policies of racism. Why is the question. And I'll leave that as a rhetorical, no answer needed. But think about that. Why haven't we applied that same energy? Why haven't we awakened to that same dilemma? It's mind boggling. Uh, a third lesson is this one. That is education is not the only battleground for integration. We, uh, as a country, have decided that we do not want to be an integrated society. That's a very significant lesson coming out of Little Rock. In 1998, I was hired by the school board in Little Rock to be a desegregation consultant. Now, I mentioned that date particularly because it's 1998. That's a lot of years since 1957, right? Why do they need a desegregation consultant in 1998? Well, because they had no intention of ever desegregating the schools in Little Rock. They have no intention of doing that even now. But they wanted to hire me, and they wanted to use my credentials and background as human fodder, part of their PR campaign. Hey, we're good guys. Yeah, we hired Terry Roberts. Well, I knew they were lying. In fact, I told the superintendent that very thing when I sat down for my interview, 
and he explained what they were doing. And I said, I don't think you really want to do anything at all. He said, oh, no, no, we're serious. We want, we want to hire you. I said, yeah, that's, that's what's bothering me. I see no evidence that you really want to do anything. He laughed. He said, oh, no, we do. He said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to take this job anyway, but you'll find out what I've been doing after a time and you will fire me. It took him four years to find out. He fired me in 2002. So, you know, I predicted what would happen. It just took a little longer than I thought. Maybe he was a friend of the governor. But in any case, I um, use that as an illustration because even now I'm in contact with the newly elected superintendent, uh, well, not the superintendent, but the head of the school board in Little Rock today. She's a young black female and we talk and I try and help her navigate that terrain because it's very, very vicious. She's in a position that probably will not allow her to do very much. But I keep giving her encouragement because I think it's important to keep pushing to find out if there is a way to do it, uh, to make something truly happen in that school district. No, no, you see, uh, to give you some idea of how set in the ways they, their ways that they are in Little Rock, in 1958, when the schools were all closed, the private school movement in Little Rock took off. White uh, private schools still flourish in Little Rock. They started in 1958. Some, there were some there already, but others took their place beside them. And they are really well financed and they're not going anywhere. Besides that, like I said, this country has decided it doesn't really want to be uh, an integrated country anyway. So we have to continue with that. Okay, so how are we doing for time? I was supposed to have 40 minutes. I think I've gone over my 40 minutes, but that's all right. We'll, we'll stop now and we will have dialogue. And I would invite your questions and comments to spur the dialogue. Like I said in the beginning, this is where I learn from you. So we'll call on somebody if nobody says anything soon. I'll just pick somebody out. Sure. I would ask everybody, you can you can write your questions either in the, the chat room or you can raise your hand and we will acknowledge you and turn on your your microphone. So well, there's there's a question I just saw in the chat. Yeah. Uh, the question is you said you were fired because of what you were doing there in Little Rock. Can you give us more information? Yes. Uh, I developed a program. That my thought was every single person in this school district needs to decide if they're going to be honest enough to tell the truth about what they really want to happen from their position in the school district. And I felt that if there were enough people who could come to terms with their own issues around race and around their own embracing of the ideology of racism, we might be able to identify some of them and get them out of there and replace them with people who were more balanced in their thinking. And I presented this program to the superintendent, but I heard nothing in response. Months go by. And then after about nine months, I decided I would act. I figured nine months is a proper gestation period for just about anything. So why not this report? I got a spot on the local cable news, which televised the school board meetings. And I opted for a spot that would give me a chance to quote, update what I'd been doing. The superintendent was a bit nervous. He called me, he says, what are you gonna say? What are you gonna say? I said, well, I'm just gonna give an update on my activities. And I did, I gave an update on all the stuff I'd been doing. And then at the end, I said, nine months ago, I submitted a report to the superintendent and his group I've heard nothing. When I got back to the hotel, my phone was ringing off the hook. School board personnel wanted to know, why did you call us out? Why did you do that on TV? I said, well, well I just gave it an update. I just gave an update. Well, public pressure was brought to bear. They were forced to resurrect that proposal. And we began to run people through the program. It was a program on... Awareness, basically. Dr. Uh, because my thought was we needed people to be yes no i was going to yes. give you, i was going to give you the next Danny? um i'm going to give you okay the next. i'm ready okay um 
Oh, somebody's kind of jumping over me, so let me get back to it. Um, in 1970, the Pasadena Unified School District implemented that school, a school busing plan. Do you feel that the issues, history, and discussion regarding integrated busing in Pasadena should be recognized at its anniversary and taught in our local secondary schools or community colleges? I imagine it already is. If it's a school district worthy of uh, being a school district, because your local history makes you know you're part of the curriculum, we have to know where we are and what we've been doing. Yeah, I would say, uh, whether you uh, celebrate it or not, I don't know. Uh, it's not part of my mindset. Uh, I'm more about individuals figuring out this stuff for their for themselves. Uh, if the Pasadena School District has not taught all kids to become executives of their own learning, then I would think they're falling behind anyway. Uh, if any kid who doesn't know that should know that. Well, got a, I got another question for you. Um, curious on your thoughts on allies who have suddenly become awoke and seem to want to make change. How do you balance that with people who are firmly committed to racist ideology? Uh, well, I'm not sure, but uh, I have two things to say about that. Uh, first, about allies. Uh, I think it's a, a fairly weird concept. Uh, when I first heard it, uh, and it's a new term for me, I hadn't heard it until quite recently, I was dumbfounded. How can there be such a thing as allies when this issue we face is a problem we all have, the problem we have across lines of race and culture, et cetera? It's not about allies from one group to another. That is, simply extends the we they dichotomy. And I'd like to get rid of any vestige of that. Uh, and the analogy I use is if this country is invaded by an enemy nation and we all have to fight, who's the ally among us? I would think we're all part of the same group of soldiers, right? And so it is now as we deal with issues of race, it's our problem. It's not just the problem faced by people of color. No, it's our problem as Americans. It's as American as anything else I can imagine. Second part, I've forgotten. What was that? Uh, the, second, the second part is how do you balance that with people who are firmly committed to a racist ideology? So those well, are... I don't think it's a matter of balancing. I, I think it's just a matter of understanding that that is a true statement about who we are. There are many people uh, as judged by the number of people who cast a vote for uh, Donald Trump. Uh, yes, uh, there are people who have embraced fully the ideology of racism, no question about it. We can't do anything about that, by the way. We cannot think for other people. We can acknowledge who they are and call them out if we choose. I choose to call them out. Often when I talk, I invite people who voted for Trump to come and talk to me afterwards. We'll meet outside or something and we can discuss the issue in some detail. Uh, I think it's just, I think it's reprehensible that we as a country would allow somebody like that to run for office in the first place. All right, we have, we have another question um, and I'm gonna kind of take it in, in chunks because it's about four questions all kind of wrapped into one. But how do you feel about today's youth and how are they different from the earlier civil rights projects of the 1950s and 60s? Um, particularly as it relates to those who have gotten involved since the uh, George Floyd murder and the Breonna Taylor murder uh, and kind of in the, the wake of those who are woke, this awakening that we were talking about earlier. So, I actually don't know the answer to that. Uh, I have two grandsons, um, young men, and I have tried uh, since they were infants to help them develop an awareness of who they are as young black men in this society and how they can survive. Um, so what I think about young kids is they all need to learn who they are and that they exist in a society that is structured the way it is and they need to learn how to survive. They have to learn how to navigate the system. So that would be my thoughts on that in terms of what I think about young people. Uh, you know. Uh, Young people today are not unlike young people of any era. Uh, they're trying to find who they are, you know, how they fit in, et cetera. I would simply encourage that to continue. I have counseled 
a number of young people who come to me and ask if, if uh, protesting or picketing or you know, doing that makes sense. I said, only if you know what you're doing. And you can only know what you're doing once you've educated yourself. Then you know why you're out there picketing. Uh, if you're just out there waving a banner, it makes no sense. Make, makes a lot of sense. Um, let me ask you this question, Dr. Roberts. Given, given society, the, the many issues that are going on in our society uh, today, what do you see as the greatest threat to the advancement of African Americans and other people of color um, in in, to, in our current society, and is it different from? No, no, I think it's the same, and, and that is willful ignorance. People who are willfully ignorant of the fact of who we are and who we have been. It's impossible to live in a society and not understand what's going on. It's apparent. It's apparent. You know, in the wake of uh, George Floyd's murder. A number of my neighbors approached me as a, my wife and I walked around during our daily walk and they wanted to let us know how sad they were. We, we said, why are you sad? Well, George Floyd was killed, really. Uh, <laughs> so this is just, this is new to you. Uh, black men are killed in this country on a daily basis and, and this one stands out, why? And I think it had to do with the fact that it was so highly publicized and televised. Somebody had a cell phone out that day. You know. Uh, probably propitious because in the absence of that cell phone, I don't think a lot of these people would have been so sad. Um, they would have simply put him in that same category as they put all these other people who wind up dead on the streets of this country. So I'm not that sympathetic, but willful ignorance is problematic. No question about it. Not knowing, there's no reason not uh, to know. Like I say, the information is all written down. You can find it. You can find it, you can seek it out. I, but I know what happens is in, in our country, um, Bernard Malamud, author, wrote a book in the 1960s called The Fixer. And in that book, one sentence stands out. I'll never forget the first time I read it. And it goes like this, in a sick country, any sign of health is seen as an insult to those who live off the sickness. And I think that's so very much apparent in terms of this country. We are very sick, no question about it. And there are many people who profit off the sickness. So any, any effort to reform or to move forward is seen as an insult by these folk. Slumlords, slumlords don't want reform. They're making a fortune extracting money from poor people. Why would they want to change? What incentive would there be for them to change? only if they begin to alter their thought process and make different choices. It doesn't have to be that way. And yet that's part of the ongoing sickness. We live in a society rich enough to feed every single person. And yet we cling to outmoded thinking that goes along these lines. Uh, I made it, you can make it horrendous way of thinking. No. And we all know the system is rigged so that some people can make it, others don't. That's also apparent. It has been for centuries. Nothing's changed about that. And yet, most of us are willfully ignorant of all of that and cling to this sort of uh, origin story that has no merit in my estimate. Well, thank you, Dr. Robert. We could go on for hours and hours, um, but I thank you for coming and sharing your enlightenment, sharing your life's experiences um, with the group. Uh, at this time, I'm gonna pass it over to uh, Bulim to go ahead and close us out. Uh, I wanna encourage everybody to hang around. We can't be together socially, so we're gonna kind of hang out at the end of this uh, event and socialize via Zoom. But thank you all for coming, Dr. Roberts. This has been inspiring as always. Um, but thank you. That's all I can tell you is uh, you, have, you have really been a, a wonderful uh, speaker tonight. So thank you. Bulam, Bulam, you, Bulalam, you are on mute. 
Steve. Hopefully he'll unmute himself in a second or Steven can unmute him. <laughs> 